By the way, Mistra knows about Manchun's because she's been watching Manchun because she wanted to sucker Manchun into being one of her chosen. She's been watching everything he does. I'm Ivan with Many Realms, and today we're talking about Manchun. Lord of Zental Keep and founder of the Zentarum, this master spellcaster has always been as dangerous as he is charming. Manchun has always been shrouded in a bit of mystery, including is that person that I just ran into actually Manchun, or is that just another one of his clones? To add to that, is the real Manchun even still alive? Well, Ed Greenwood answers all these questions and more on today's episode of Realms Lore, and he also tells us a secret about Manchun that's never been revealed before anywhere until now. And don't forget, if you want to show your support for Ed and get exclusive access to all of the extended cuts of these conversations, including tons more Realms lore, be sure to go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood and become a protector of the realms today. In the, in the definition of villain that says, I am in this for my personal gain, and if you are in my way, I will be ruthless about walking over, around, or through you. Um, I, I think... I think in modern parlance, we label some people like that psychopaths. You know, <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. they can be charming. They're not necessarily uh, going to do bad things to you unless you're in their way. And then all bets are off. Um, so Manchun is one of those. For instance, um, one of the first stories I wrote about Manchun, a story called The Long Sword years ago, which I also created spell singers for that story. In that short story, Manchun and his older brother, amongst other people, go off. Lord Chess is also there. Um, he's not a lord yet, by the way. Uh, but they're all sort of young punks. They all go off to um, explore a tomb. And Manchun murders his brother on the way. Oh. So that, oh, he can be the head <laughs> honcho instead of his older brother. I think that one of the aspects of great beauty of your stories and the realms and also D&D is that there's a lot of subtlety to the, the quote unquote villains. Um, you know, they have an extraordinary depth, which is something that I think you really achieved with Manchun. As you were saying, he's debonair, he's, he's handsome, uh, he's an extremely powerful wizard. I, I believe he even has the favor of Mistra. Um, and he has a lot going on uh -huh. with him, but you're right that he's very in it for himself, and I guess that would be the best qualifier, if any, <laughs> to, to call him a villain. Mister was interested in him as a chosen. And see, he, here's the thing. A lot of fans get the mistaken idea about Mistra that she's a goody two-shoes, that she's a good goddess. And she is in that she values mortals and doesn't think you should mistreat mortals. She thinks that's stupid and short-sighted to mistreat the people you want to worship you, the people who in the, in unintentionally dictate how much power you have as a deity. She just thinks it's, it's good, it's good farming to take good care of, of mortals, but she's dedicated to protecting the weave and increasing and augmenting magic, magic use everywhere in the world. And for this, Manchun would be a great um, servant, tool. And she offered him a role as one of her chosen. And Manchun rejected it. Truly? Wow. Yeah, and, and we see that in, in um, it's in my Sage of Shadowdale, uh, uh, not the initial rejection, because the initial rejection happened way in the past. What you're seeing is her trying to give him a second chance. And, and he basically um, smiles and nods and then does exactly the opposite of what she wanted him to do. She <laughs> He attacks Elminster or whatever at the time. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah right. I, I, I recall your, I recall your offer goddess and guess what? Here's what I think of it. You know, um, so yeah, he wants to do his own thing. Richard Lee Byers came up with this marvelous saying years ago. He said, in my father's house, there are many Manchuns. Um, and of course, <laughs> uh, that is in keeping with the Manchun Wars. Yeah, I was about to say, that's going to come up today. Well, for years, I had the fact that Manchun could be a recurring villain because every time you killed him, he came back because he could clone. He had his own special cloning spell, and he'd already stashed many clones away. 
the the good thing, the advantage you got if you killed Manchu was that his his clone, whichever clone activated, and he was trying to activate the older ones first, because they don't keep, you know, they have a shelf life. In his um that that clone that clone that came back um knew less than the one you'd killed because its memory started when it had been made into a clone. So sometimes you could, in effect, get Manchun off your back by killing him, and then the one that woke up and came after you wouldn't come after you because it didn't know about you, because you weren't part of its memories. I would actually like to take a quick step back, if we could, and just talk about the Manchun Wars, because it is wild, <laughs> and I'm not sure that everybody exactly understands kind of the origins of that. That was a fun idea, plot device, that occurred, I think, to Stephen Shen when he was traffic cop of the realms, when he realized we had these multiple clones activated. And the way the game works, um, if you have multiple clones active at once, they go mad. And they try and kill each other. They start hunting each other to kill each other because um, you can't have multiple copies of the same mind, or so the spell claims. Now, Manchun had a special clone spell, but it was still, let's use this thing where all the, the clones can, they're aware of each other and gunning for each other. In Manchun's case, they had a little more control than the classic um, clone spell, where they literally go gaga and do nothing else but um, charge towards each other, kill, kill, you know. Yeah, that was the stasis clone spell, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah. Manchun's have a little more self-control than that. Or so the, the thinking goes. But, yeah, he... Stephen looked at this and said, so we have all these, like, clones running around, and they would be trying to kill each other. Aha! The Manchun Wars. Now, the reason why he made these clones initially, it was a, it was a power play, right? As the leader of the Zentarim, it was to exert more control over the realms. It was also to make sure that uh, he couldn't be eliminated, because here's the thing. Um, the Zentrim, uh, gained power, and, and we see this in So High a Price, which is the short story I wrote for Realms of Infamy all those years ago. Um, uh, but it's an uneasy alliance. Manchun is, um, uh, allied with priests of Bane, and they're going through all this stuff with the High Imperceptor and Fazul, and... Uh, vying for power within their own ranks. And he also is, um, they are getting to be as prominent as they can be by being in league with beholders. And he, he rapidly realized that the beholders are using all the humans. They don't care. And any particular human could drop out of the story at any time. If the beholders get tired of him, they'll just off him. And Manchun had plans, and he realized that his plans would bring him into conflict with Beholders multiple times. And one of the ways of making sure that he didn't fall out of the story by being killed off too easily was to have all of these clones, because some of the Beholders would say, oh, let's not bother, because Manchun will only come back. Let's not bother. That's a waste of our time. And Manchun, like everybody else, doesn't want to be killed horribly. It hurts. <laughs> so um, he was setting things up so hopefully he wouldn't get killed off horribly. And, you know, um, they would they would think of uh, him as still a useful tool. As they, in fact, that's how most of the Beholders think about Fazul. And everybody thinks, oh, Fazul is such hot stuff. No, uh, Manchun was the hot stuff. When... Fazul, quote, defeated Manchun. It was because Manchun saw this as a perfect way of getting out of the terrible desk job. <laughs> so he tricked Fazul, and Fazul wanted the power, and Fazul got the power, and then Fazul was stuck in the director's chair <laughs> and not having fun. And Manchun was going, ha, ha, ha! <laughs> Ed, why don't we talk a little bit maybe about the origins of the Zentarum and Zentilkeep and 
and maybe Manchun's thought process and, and what went into that and, and his motivations behind starting something like the Zentrum. Well, Manchun was what we would call um, an idle, an idle rich kid. And there's nothing wrong with being an idle rich kid uh, unless you're down the pecking order, which Manchun was, which means you don't have any control over anything. And you're not going to get much of the money. You've got an older brother in the way. You're not going to inherit anything. And you're pretty much a wastrel. And everybody sneers at you because you're a wastrel. As in, yeah, you know how to get drunk. Isn't that an accomplishment? You know how to misbehave. You know, isn't that an accomplishment? Yeah. yeah. What we see in those early stories is him getting out of that. And we're also seeing something else. Um... We're seeing him make his bid for real power. Manchun wanted two things. He wanted endless riches, and that's how he convinced all of these other people, wizards. Wizards don't like being told what to do. I don't think many people do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not many people. But <laughs> if you don't kill a wizard, the wizard has the power to be exceptional. It's like being the... um one guy in your poor block, your poor neighborhood, who actually has the skill to make it in the National Football League. So you can get a payday that other people are only going to dream of. And your career might be short, but you can still get money and power and respect. And lots of people know your name and all this stuff. Well, that's the thing Manchun was gunning for. But he was also thinking, here's how we can get loads of money forever. And you're thinking... Well, what do you need more money for? Are you just nuts? Well, no. If you're a wizard, um, spell research is getting all these special things in the early editions of the game, these material components, which were quite often rare and expensive. It costs lots of money. And you want to be able to sit in your tower and do experiments and read books. And getting the books costs money. You either have to endanger yourself by going adventuring, or you have to hire adventurers like mercenaries and they're they're very expensive these people <laughs> to go and get books for you or to go and get whatever and you want to spend your time in your lab you know being a mad scientist uh you know creating your new spells um it it all takes money and you want a, a steady stream of money and the zentrum was originally formed in order to get the shortest trade route between the the ore the metals coming out of the mines north of the Moon Sea to the wider world, and in particular, across the heartlands, those long, perilous trade routes, perilous because of brigands and monsters, and, you know, you're out in the open in a caravan, and a dragon awakens and it's hungry, and there you are, spread out, sitting ducks from the air, a target. And if you can control the shortest trade route, and that shortest trade route is across the desert where nobody else will go, then you can make money. And the plan B was to go through um, the Stonelands, just north of the rest of Cormir, because that's the shortest trade route through Yellowsnake Pass and so on, if you're not going into Anorak, the Great Desert. So, I mean, uh, that's what the Zentrum was formed to do, get the shortest trade route, make all this money. Okay. That is where Manchun was concentrating himself early on. And what he was also doing is he set up a Zentrum with all of these magelings. They were, no, you know, uh, it's a, you know, slang term, but magelings, young mages. And he didn't care what happened to them. He didn't care if they offed each other, which is why he let them have this cutthroat, kill each other competition, because he was interested in the fittest surviving, the strongest wow. and most ruthless, wow. because that's what he wanted for his thing. And that's how he sets it up. And in the early stories, and they stopped publishing a lot of these just because they stopped having uh, easy avenues for short stories to be published as opposed to novel-length works. There were tons of things happening, and it was cut out of Spellfire. My novel, Spellfire, got cut by a third you know, of what was going to be in it. And again, the personnel changed at the head of the book department. What they wanted to publish changed. So in between, 
my being told, uh, Ed, we need you to write us a novel in which you show us the realms. And don't worry about word count. Uh, whatever it is, uh, we'll publish it because we need need you to show us the realms down to, no, it has to be this long, let's chop it off. Okay, so two-thirds of that novel got left on the cutting room floor. And one of the things that got left out was a lot of scenes that were quite nasty by the, the Code of Ethics standards of Manchun letting people off each other. Oh, my. And because that was his goal. Yeah. He wanted... The, he wanted the wizards that were left to be very capable and to know that if you cross me, you will die. So don't cross me. You know, that was the two things he was wanting, trying to drive home. And the other thing was, they were in league with beholders, and the beholders did not care one whit what happened to humans except as tools to further their... And the beholders were playing off the Fazul's and the high end perceptor, who is there's civil war amongst the the priests at this point, um, and, and Manchun is just taking shameless advantage of all that. And I wanted to show all that how messy it can all be, not because I was a sadist or anything, but because it's maximum play opportunities time. If you're there when all this stuff is going down, then your adventurers can actually have a meaningful role. You can change the world. Right, what, right. What your adventurers do matters all of a sudden. And it's really, and it's also in flux for a long time. So if you think you've defeated this and fixed things, which was the problem with fighting the cult of the dragon, and thinking, oh, yeah, you know, you know, we, we, we took care of it. We killed the dragon. Yeah, there's another one. They just made another <laughs> track of witch. You know, you know, what you thought you got away with, you didn't. You know, and it's like, oh, what do you do when you save the world? Go and save it again. Uh, but <laughs> but in new and interesting ways. And that's what I was doing with Manchun and his clones. I was keeping them. You, know, you may think you beat the big baddie. Well, you get to beat them all over again. Okay, so, Ed, I feel like this is the question on most people's minds, at least mine. Can you give a definitive answer? Is the real Manchun still alive, or is he dead? Oh, the very first Manchun? The very first, the original mention. He's still alive. And he's watching all this. Yes. Yes, he's still alive. <laughs> all right, man. He realized long ago that this this thing he was trying is crazy toots. Uh, it's not going to work, and it's going to drive him insane, and it's going to be far more damage than it's worth. So he bugged out. And by bugged out, I mean... He graduated to the, I'm just going to sit back and keep myself hidden and watch. I'm going to watch what things happen. And I'm going to try from time to time doing tiny, small things in the way of manipulations and seeing how they affect people and seeing how this all turns out. And that is how I'm going to derive my entertainment. And that is what my life is going to be because I've now got all the stuff I wanted to get. So now it's just a question of let's see what happens if I do this. <laughs> and so then Manchun turns into that sadistic doctor who leans over the helpless patient who's restrained <laughs> on the table and he's, he's trepanned the top of his or her head off and he's poking <laughs> and he says, what happens when I do this? Oh, and what happens when I do this? Can you feel anything when I do this? That's Manchu now. I don't mean he's any less of a villain, but he's off stage. And what that means is he's watching. He's watching you right now. Oh, no. Which means if you do something to something, something or someone he likes, like perhaps he wants his Zentarim to succeed, this, this thing he struggled so hard for, and perhaps you're making headway about killing Zents, stopping them here, there, and everywhere. So maybe he's just going to alert your foes so somebody can come gunning for you. And maybe he's just going to thwart your next grand scheme so you can't get away with it because it's time to take you down a peg or two because you've done things to the, the Zentrum that he loved or wants to see succeed, if not loved. So he's now going to play with you a bit. 
You see that you could do this. Uh, again, it's all story opportunities. Isn't the original Manchun being like that a lot more fun for yeah. story opportunities <laughs> than go. another sort of Manchu? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why you do it. Okay, Ed, so I figured we can wrap this up by doing the usual segment of the show where I ask for secret knowledge of the realms. Uh, do you have anything that's special or particular that is about Manchun that most people might not know about or something that you wish more people knew about when playing Manchun? Oh, yeah. Manchun has a daughter. Oh. Oh, is that so? Can you go into more depth? Consider... Shapeshift. Consider mating with a dragon. Okay. Consider how insane you'd have to be to mate with a dragon. Okay. Consider how ma how insane Manchun is. Okay. Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That is fantastic. So is this something that if folks go ahead and look up on their own, they're going to be able to get more details on? Or is this something that... Only nope. we know here right Not now. Not a thing. Yeah, only we knew it. Until I write more in the, you know, for the Patreon or somewhere else, only we knew it. Cue all the questions tomorrow. No, um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, right. And, <laughs> and to all those people who ask questions tomorrow, I will simply say, you're going to have to wait till I write it because <laughs> there are real world obligations that that slow me down on feeding you realms lore. But, like I said earlier, I want to be there for you, and eventually, um, scratch your itch when it comes to provide lore for the realms so that you too can um, be killed by Manchun's daughter. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, so that... <laughs> That's perfect. I mean, you've heard it here. Nowhere else in the entire world are you going to hear about Manchun's daughter. This is the only and most exclusive place to hear about stuff like that. By the way, Mistra knows about Manchun's daughter because she's been watching Manchun because she wanted to sucker Manchun into being one of her chosen. She's been watching everything he does. And so therefore she knows about the daughter and she hasn't done anything to reveal the daughter to her chosen. Mm. Okay, okay. <laughs> Now I'm feeling now juicy, I'll leave it there. You know what I mean? Now, I'll now leave I'm it like, there. you got to scratch the itch, man. <laughs> I need to know more. I'm going to have to talk to you after this episode. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's always a really special moment to me when Ed chooses to share something that's never been revealed before, especially when it's something like the Forgotten Realms, which has been around for like a while now. If you liked what you saw in the video, be sure to hit the like button because your support means a lot to us. If you want to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to be let known whenever new videos like this come out, be sure to hit the bell icon. And for the unabridged version of this conversation, including tons more exclusive realms lore, be sure to go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood and become a protector of the realms right now. And as always, we just really want to thank the people that helped to make this possible, including our sponsors, RPG Match and Many Realms. We also want to thank all of the patrons, because without you, there is no way we could make any of this happen especially our Legends of the Realms. Kenny, Francisco Cabral, South Hill Sages, Stephen Snow, Gabriel, Martin Berlanda, John Foster, Gerald Brady, Alex Erie, Hunter Weber, Michael Scattergood, Jeremy E. Grunemeyer, Robert McDonald, Fire Wraith, Melody Sigers, Gustavo Tortado, Puffles, Brian Kreutzel, and RPG Match. Hopefully, none of us will experience being eaten by a swooping dragon in our lives. <laughs> Hopefully, none of us will experience having some guy with a, a beard he hasn't washed and uh, um, turn us into a frog with a spell because he didn't like us. Hopefully, none of that stuff will happen in real life, but we can experience it by reading good fantasy fiction or playing around a table, uh, playing a fantasy role-playing game by gamers who are...